Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 50. We've made it to the big 5-0, people. And this one is uh, Jason Schneidman. Now, Jason Schneidman is a uh, hairstylist who works at the Chris McMillan Salon in Beverly Hills. Um, he is also one of the most genuine, authentic people I think I've ever had the pleasure of talking to. He's such a fun guy with some of the craziest stories and... To say that he's been through hard times would not do it credit. Um, but you look at him now, and he's this happy-go-lucky, extremely talented guy who's out there making a difference. Uh, but when you realize the road that he took to get here, um, he's been sober since '04, um, And when I say sober, I mean sober from uh, the other end of the spectrum as far as drugs and alcohol goes. And I, Jason is very candid. And I absolutely love that because I think to be uh, to institute real change, you have to be genuine. You know, you have to tell the truth. And Jason doesn't sugarcoat it, and I I love that about him. And this conversation, I mean, we talk about how he started working at the Chris McMillan Salon, uh, risks that he's taken, where he's from, um, his personality type, uh, and then we talk about sobriety and his ground zero and what turned him around and the road to recovery. And that leads to how I became aware of him, which is uh, street cuts, uh, is what he calls them. Jason goes out and gives haircuts to the homeless. And I could not be more about that. Uh, he's out there making real human connections, real human interactions uh, with fellow human beings. You know, And I, I love the idea that somebody whose clientele includes you know, Hugh Jackman, Bruno Mars... Uh, James Corden, Liam Neeson, the same guy is giving haircuts to homeless people. And I just, I love that. So I reached out to Jason and uh, we got to talking. And this originally was going to be like a 20 minute interview, uh, but his stories were so good and I was so into them that uh, we went for almost an hour. But um, uh, Jason, you know, thank you so much for your time. Uh, if you're listening to this, I really appreciate the opportunity to tell your story to everyone else. Please enjoy. The Interesting Podcast, episode number 50, with Jason Schneidman. Theme song time. Hello? Yo, yo. There we are. Can you hear me fine? I can. Good, good. I can hear you as well. How are you doing, my friend? Doing good, thank you. Good, good. You'll learn this is a, this is very lax, because I've learned with anything, uh, when you mention interview, typically people are like, oh, and they button up, and then you ask a question, you get an answer, and it's not really free-flowing, and I like to, I like to yeah. get to know people, as a, I, I'm sure you do as well. Yes. But uh, I, I, sure. I did have a question. Where are you from? Um, so originally I grew up in Long Beach, right on the border of L.A. and Orange County. Oh, okay, okay. That makes a lot of sense. Given... Small, small, little cool, little surf town, super sleepy, ride your bike. It was just, uh, yeah, it was a cool little upbringing. Sure. I love that you've maintained the vibe as well. Thanks, man. Do you do you surf? I do. That's I spent all my time surfing from twelve to twenty. Really? I was in the water, and I was ditching school, and it was just my everything was being out in the water. It's it's definitely one of the best feelings I get. Sure. Uh, at the end of the day, and I've tapped into this service work, which uh, is a similar feeling at the end of the day. I I love your Instagram account for a hundred reasons. One of which. You have a biker dude kind of feel to you? You ride bikes? Yes. What do you ride? Um, I've had multiple Harleys over the years, and it's just been mostly Harleys. That makes sense. That makes sense. My dad's a big Harley rider. Oh, uh, I love that. I, I just got my motorcycle license like three months ago, and yeah. uh, I've been riding a Honda Rebel because it's the closest thing to a Harley to start on. Yeah. But it's, it's a... It's yeah, a I, I actually learned on that in, in, the, in the little motorcycle school. 
yeah. that I went to years ago, and uh, they were teaching us on little Hondas. There you go. I learned on a Harley at a motorcycle school, <laughs> so we reversed it. That's cool. But you are a hairstylist. Yep. When did you start cutting hair? So um, I somehow, some way, got a pair of clippers young, and I can't even remember this kid that I was where I was like, let's cut hair, yeah. you know? And it was like, <laughs> it's like, God, what was I thinking? I, I guess pretty fearless and pretty reckless, you know? So at 14, I was going after my friend's head with clippers and uh just because you know that <laughs> opens a whole story if you're ready for that i'm but, ready uh, for it <laughs> do you want to flow okay let's flow so <laughs> basically at 14 um in my little sleepy beach town uh of orange county most of my friends were just toehead surfers just blonde you know mm -hmm. it was quicksilver it was billabong and you know it was just surf oh yeah city, you know and and my parents were New Yorkers, and uh, really, so you know, I was kind of the minority, being one Jewish, two dark hair, and <laughs> you know, kind of having an edgy New York upbringing, sure, um, where New Yorkers are outspoken, and uh, so I was in my uh, little sleepy town. My parents were taking me around the world to see stuff. They would take me to Venice Beach. Um, I would go to New York City. Um, I was, you know, seeing different styles and trends. Mm -hmm. And I would bring them back to my town. And I would tell my friends, I'm like, dude, we have to do this. This is what's going on out of our little world here, out of our little bubble. Yeah. And um, we went through uh, different phases every week or every month where one week we were punk rock and then, you know, I was shaving mohawks and then we went into this mod era mm -hmm. where we had trench coats and eyeliner That's and awesome. we had egg whites in our hair <laughs> and we'd have to get a, a Vespa scooter of and, course. you know, and then the next week was new romantic when that phase hit and we were like Duran Duran. I was doing these haircuts of like, you know, just full, you know, Duran Duran haircuts. And um, so I was a guy that was just kind of fearless and going for it. And, and we would do this and we would go out to hook up with girls. It was working really well for us because we <laughs> would stand out and they were like, oh, my God. And so we were getting laid because I was the one that was, you know, changing our looks and people were gravitating it, sure. gravitating to us, you know. Sure. We were going to Knott's Berry Farm, and it was like under eight clubs, and we were there, and you know, <laughs> it was it was working. So that's how I got into it. Gotcha. That's that's actually pretty amazing, and and fits with you as well. Like always being ahead of the curb and stylish, and like this is happening, this is happening. You know, I I work at Chris McMillan Salon in Beverly Hills. I've been there for 16 years, and it turned out that a lot of celebrities started coming to my chair. Uh, because of the fact that I had put the 10,000 hours into men's haircutting. Sure. And uh, I started getting pretty good at men's haircutting. And everybody was like, whoa, you're so good at men's haircutting. And I was like, thank you. And and so when you would call the salon, and Chris McMillan's the elite, oh, most yeah. amazing salon like in the world. One of one of the most you know amazing salons in the world. Yeah. And I'm smack dab right in the middle of Beverly Hills. So you know, celebrities have to get their hair cut. And so they were ending up coming there. And so when they would call and they'd be like, can I get in with Chris? And Chris was out of town. I was the, the guy that was just riding Chris's coattails and I was catching the run off. There you go. And um, so that's how I ended up getting his clientele was, you know, paying the dues over the years, cutting my friends and then going on to cut other men's hair throughout my whole journey, which was, kind of out of my hands it kind of just happened that way yeah that's pretty amazing actually with your clientele when a celebrity comes in do they do you have input on their haircut or do they come in with an idea or is it like a creative process i always have an input it's it's I, it, that's my problem yeah <laughs> i mean it's like it wasn't until i was able to channel it and ask people if they want to hear my input yeah. when it started working for me yeah <laughs> um, you, you definitely I don't want to that. <laughs> 
Yeah, I yep. was taught that. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I look at people walking down the street, and I'm like, I have input. You know, it's like <laughs> it just happens. You yeah, know, pull, pull over. Being, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's hair police. Pull over. They, Love it. Yeah, yeah, you just pull out your clippers <laughs> and your badge. Take a seat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's pretty amazing, actually, that, that you have that sort of – that's ballsy, man. Like you said, you're always on the front of the curve, and to have input on something like that – I mean, like you said, you're working at the Chris McMillan Salon. Like, that's the dude that invented the Rachel, if I'm if I'm understanding yep, this correctly. absolutely. That dude, like, defined yep. hair. That's crazy. And you're you're that guy. You're right there in the thick of it. That's that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Was Well, I mean, you keep bringing up stuff, and it takes me down these avenues. And so yeah. let me just tell you about Chris a Let's little bit. Let's do it. So I uh, – I mean, this goes way back. I got to go back to my childhood and, Good. and everything all because it all leads me to Chris. So mm-hmm. uh, just to tell you the story, um, you know, I was surfing from 12 to 20. Mm-hmm. I uh, was barely grade, graduating high school. I, had, I didn't graduate in my class. I had to take summer school because I failed my senior year uh, because I was able to sign out from high school because I turned 18. Uh, <laughs> You know, and so I had my Volkswagen Bug with surf racks on top, and I would just pretend like I was going to school, but I would make a right turn and go surf. And, and so they didn't pass me. My English teacher was like, I'm just so sorry. I can't do it. You just haven't been here. Sure. And I was able to manipulate and, and schmooze through all of school because the teachers liked me because I was a people person, right. and I wasn't a good student, you know, and I feel like a lot of hairstylists have this similar story, just <laughs> beauty school dropout, we're creative, oh, yeah. you know, we, we, um, we just, school doesn't work for us, it's just a different part of the brain, you know, we're creative, Absolutely. And so, so I was into surfing, I was ditching, I barely graduated high school, and, um, you know, my parents were like, why don't you pick a profession and we'll pay for it, and I was like, I don't know what I want to do, and they're like, once you do hair, you do all your friends' hair. And I was like, 1988, it wasn't a really cool profession back then. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think the only one who was cool was Warren Beatty sure. back then, you know. <laughs> so I was in fear. You know, I'm a dude. And I'm like, I don't know. Everyone's going to think I'm gay. And I yeah. wasn't comfortable with my sexuality back then, you know. Sure. And you know how you know kids are. And, and I was like so in fear. And my sister dated the pro surfer in our town and she was three years older and I always looked up to her. And, uh, so she gave me a little pep talk. She was like, yeah, Brent, Brent, you know, is this good looking guy, super feminine. And so basically, uh, she gave me this pep talk and she said, you know, guys always come up to Brent and it's like, yeah, you're gay or whatever, you know, you're femi. And he was like, yeah, but I'd fuck your girlfriend. <laughs> and, uh, so I was like, yeah, I love that. I love that. You know? Cause yeah. And so she talked me into it. I went to hair school. I was the only dude there. There was 30 girls, and they were surrounding me going, whoa, how would you do that with a clipper? So all of a sudden, the, the rock star, you know, at hair school, yeah. you know, I was hooking up with girls left and right. I was like, this is amazing, you know? <laughs> so hair school is a year program, right, full right. time. took me five years to graduate, okay. and I got kicked out of five different schools because <laughs> I was continuing to do what I did in high school where I was ditching and surfing and I was partying. And, but the good thing was you can clock in and out with uh-huh. hair school and you get your hours and you go back. And the other good thing was I got a lot of different instructor training through going to hair schools because I went to so many schools with so many different teachers. Sure. But uh, so I finally got the license um, back up a little bit. Mm-hmm. When I turned 18, I was like, I'm free. And I couldn't wait. You know, like like in high school where I was ditching and surfing, but you know, I just was like, I got to get away from my family, I got to get away from my parents, and I was a hustler and a survivor, and I didn't need anybody. So I jumped in my Volkswagen, and we were in Palm Springs for spring break because that was the spot to go to for spring break. Yeah, and uh, me and my friends, we were there, and we were all doing push-ups, we had wife beaters on, we were all tan. <laughs> it was all about like, meeting girls, and they were on there. You know, they're ninja motorcycles with the G-strings on the back and rabbit convertibles, and people are jumping in and out of cars with squirt guns, and this was in the 80s, you know. Oh, yeah. And it was unbelievable. There was nothing like it, right? Spring break back in the day. Oh, yeah. So 
we're there early and we meet the guys who own production companies down in San Diego. And they were doing a rave right off of the strip in Palm Springs. And it was at a, it was at a racquetball bowling alley. And each racquetball court had a different genre of music. So one room was, one room was techno, the other one was house, the other one was hip hop. And they gave us a, a stack of flyers and they said, hey, do you guys want to pass these flyers out? And you get to talk to girls. <laughs> and we'll give you a club list so you can invite who you want. You'll get a free bar tab. And wow. we were like, absolutely, it's on. Yeah. <laughs> we're walking down the strip with these flyers. And we're like, hey, girl, let's come to the And so that taught me how to approach people by doing that, which I use today when I go out and I do these uh, street cuts that I've been doing. But yeah. So I became a club promoter that week. And these guys who own the production company were like, you guys are amazing. You guys packed the place. This is unreal. Um, how about if you come down to San Diego and I'll set you up beachfront with an apartment. And, um, and so I moved directly from Palm Springs to San Diego and I became a club promoter that was still cutting hair for people and partying every night. I had a bar tab. I had, you know, a club list. So it gave me the end with, with everybody. And I was close to the border. So I was feeding my addiction, if you would say. I didn't know it was an addiction back then. Right. But drugs and alcohol are a big part of my story. Of course. And uh, and so I was smoking weed all day, mm-hmm. and I was drinking from 6 o'clock at night till 6 in the morning. I was doing cocaine. I was doing ecstasy. Uh, and I actually was right by the border, so I was meeting Mexicans that were bringing me this stuff for next to nothing. And I ended up becoming a drug dealer also. So in order to support my habit, to pay my rent, to do club promotion, to stay afloat, um, I was subsidizing with drugs. So I'd go out to clubs at night and I'd have a pocket full of ecstasy, a pocket full of blow. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was in the mix and, uh, and I did that until the wheels fell off in 2000 and cops were coming for me and I had just uh, a, a big crack addiction. I started smoking crack cocaine and it was no longer about surfing or being at the clubs. It was about disappearing and just, you know, selling drugs to do drugs. Sure. And I was 130, I was 137 pounds and I had nothing left. And I basically jumped in the beater little vehicle at the time mm-hmm. just to get from San Diego back to my parents' house at 30 years old. And I detoxed on their couch myself for about a week or two. And I was like, oh, this is so great. I don't have to worry. I don't have to work to stay high. And I was just eating Lucky Charms and (laughs) watching TV. And I was like, oh, super chill. I felt like a kid again, you know, at my parents' house. Yeah. Well, that wore off. That wore off real quick. In about two weeks, I was like, what the fuck just happened to my life? Sure. 30, I'm at my parents' house. (laughs) The reality. And, um. Yeah. And so, um, so I, I was like, I got to go out and, uh, I got to have a drink and I got to do what I do. So I walked to the local bowling alley because my car got towed out in front of the house because it had expired tags on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at that point I had warrants for my arrest for paid unpaid tickets and I had bad credit and 433 and, you know, at 30 years old, I, I was, I was just a shell of a human being. I had nothing, you know, and I met this girl and she was also uh, a blackout drinker. And I met her at the bowling alley and she's like, I live in Beverly Hills. And I was like, Oh my God, my meal ticket. I'm like, (laughs) I'm getting out of my parents' house. I met this rich girl, you know, every man's dream, like just meet a rich girl and do nothing, you know, just (laughs) gigolo out. Right. Yeah. So, um, so I uh, hooked up with her that night, and she said, why don't you move in? And I was like, uh, okay. And so I moved <laughs> in the next day. Well, it turned out it wasn't Beverly Hills. Oh. And it wasn't every man's dream. It was West Hollywood. Oh, no. And I was smack dad right in the middle of Boys Town, which is like, <laughs> you know, everybody knows what Boys Town is in West yep. Hollywood. And 
here's a surfer from a small town in a fish out of water situation where it's just concrete jungle mm-hmm. and you know i just like what happened in my life once again sure so i was like well you know i said when i moved to my parents house that i'm done you know and I, i'm done with the old life and i'm going to just become a hairstylist i'm going to go legit sure. so uh no more doing what i'm doing I, you know i kind of felt like i made it out and uh so i stayed with this girl and she would go to work during the day and i walked out into boys town i was like i walked in the salon i was like hey i'm a hairstylist and they're like well you're cute cool and they gave me a job and I was cutting men's hair and I was just doing me and and I actually got really busy at the salon I was just cranking out men's hair and um and the girl would uh black out and pass out and I would take her car at night and I would go to Hollywood and I started smoking crack again Mm -hmm. in Hollywood and um and then my grandma passed away oh man and you know, this was right at 9-11. I remember when the Trade Center came down, the, the Twin Towers came down. Yeah. Um, I, I think I went to bed at, like, 6 in the morning, and, and that happened at, like, 9 in the morning, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. But I woke up, and I was in this girl's bed, and I was like, what? What is this? Oh, my God. And so that kind of gives you a timeline of where I was. Right. But uh, – but uh, so my grandma passed away, and they, and she left me twenty thousand grand, twenty thousand dollars because she had money, and I I knew I was going to inherit this money. So as soon as she passed away, like a week later, I called my parents and I was like, "Look, I'm in a you know a bad situation. I'm living with this girl. I'm not getting into it. Like, can I get some of that money and move out?" And they're like, "Sure." So they fronted me five thousand, and I was like, "Amazing!" And I went and I found an apartment right above the Viper Room. In oh, Hollywood. nice. And I moved in there, and I bought a bed, and then I was like, I space. so I started smoking crack there, and I burned through the remainder of that cash in, like, a couple of days, so I hit up my parents again. I was like, can I get another five grand? And they were like, sure. I was like, I spent it all on this, and they were like, oh, no worries, and they gave me another five days, and I was like, off to the races. Sure. I had smoked that in a week. I hit them up another week. I was like, can I get another five grand? I'm like, look, it's my money. Just, just give it to me, you know? And they're like, okay. So they gave me 20 grand total and I smoked it all in six weeks. And it was the first time my parents could see the depletion because I was, I was local. You know what I mean? I was, I was in LA, which is a lot closer than San Diego to Long Beach. So they had, they had saw that the money was gone and they had saw that I wasn't looking good. And I was always about looking good. You know what I mean? Like if I would come up for a party to see my parents, I would hit the tanning salon or I would sleep and eat for two days prior because I'm like, I need to show up for the family, you know, and (laughs) and just smoke in mirrors, you know? Yeah. So I couldn't hide it at this point. And they were like, why don't you meet us for dinner at El Fernayo? It was a place in Beverly Hills. And I was like, okay, cool. And I had smoked about $200 uh, $200 worth of crack leading up to that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I just barely made it there and I couldn't wait to get the fuck out of there. And, and, uh, so I'm sitting there and my mom's crying and I'm like blue and green, purple, 137 pounds again. Yeah. And, uh, and they were like, we're really worried about you. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm fine. I couldn't wait to get out of there. I'm like, I'm fine. You're tripping, you know? And, <laughs> and sure. they were like, once again, my sister chimed in who I looked up to her. And she was like, look, we love you and I'm here for you when you're ready. Let me know a week passed by. I, the 20 grand ran out. So I had to keep the hustle going and I ended up doing crystal meth in echo park with some gangbangers and we were printing up hundred dollar bills. Oh man. And, and so I go to the local spot where all the Mexicans knew me, where I pulled up in my truck Mm -hmm. and they were used to me coming through with the 20 grand. So I came up and they didn't flinch when I gave them a fake hundo, you know, and, sure. and I, you know, I pulled that over on him and then I went home and I smoked that and I came back like an hour later going, well, maybe they don't know. Oh, maybe boy. they didn't know that it's fake because oh, no. it hasn't been that much time. And so I went back around and 
they were like, yeah, pull up my down here. And I was like, this doesn't feel right. I'm like, I stuck it out. It was wrong. And then basically they were chasing me and I got out of there and I made it out. I called my sister and I was like, okay, I'm ready. Sure. I'm like, I'm going to rehab. So they're like, we'll come get you right now. And I was like, no, 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 I need to finish this night off, you know. And I got my hustle on and I got high the rest of the night. And they said they'll come by in the morning. And I was like, God, I'm going to go to rehab. Like, I need to, like, make sure I get high, smoke weed one more time because I knew I'd be done, done. You right. know what I mean? So hustled that, got some weed to go to rehab. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Got to and, yeah, 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 and I smoked a thumb, and then they came in, smoked a thumb, meaning a joint that fat, you know? Yeah. And at 6 in the morning, my parents came by. It was my mom and sister, actually, and I was at the top of the steps at this uh, Viper Room apartment. I was wearing, I remember to this day, I was wearing blue velvet pants, <laughs> and, I had a, and I had a wife beater on. The and uniform. that night before... I was listening to November Rain, having just a moment of like crying, breaking down, because music always really moved me. And it was like November Rain, I just remember. And I grabbed the clippers and I shaved the sides of my head that night. And uh, I looked like taxi driver. And I was at the <laughs> top of the steps. And, you know, they call it a vision for you. And I was just not a vision for you. But <laughs> yeah, I, I can picture myself. It's like at a body stand. And they're like, my sister and my mom at the bottom of the steps are like, you ready to go to rehab Tommy Lee? And I was like, oh, my God, you guys are funny. And I was like, let's do that. And so that was when I started in 2000, uh, my rehab tour. And I went to PRC, which was that celebrity show, I think. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, there was celebrity rehab. So I was at that right when it opened. And I was there. And I was like, this is cool. I got this all good. And and I went on for four years going in and out of the program. I couldn't get it. I would get some time and then, you know, I would go back out and I was doing it my way. And then in two twenty four Oh four, hold on back up. So in that four years of going in and out, Mm -hmm. I had a guy who was helping me uh, stay sober and he was like, we were at a meeting and he's like, what do you do? And I was like, I'm a hairstylist. And he's like, okay, cool. He's like, there's Carrie White. She does yada, yada, yada. And there's Chris McMillan. And he does Jennifer Aniston and all these people. So I was like, cool. I went up to both of them. I went up to Chris and I was like, hey, I heard you're the man. <laughs> and I want to come work for you. I do hair. And he like, looked at me and he's like, hmm. And he's like, how much time sober do you have? And I was like, a week. And he was like, <laughs> Um, why don't you get some time and come talk to me, you know? Sure. And I was like, cool. So I put six months together. I came back and I was like, Hey, you know, I, I got six months, bud. And he's like, he's like, okay. He's like, you're kind of cute. He's like, I'll give you one day a week. And so I was like, awesome. And I was like, yeah, but what's one day a week? Like I cut hair. Like, don't you know who I think I am? Right. You know what I mean? And, right. and the guy that was helping me was like, you need to get humbled. Sure. And, you know, so I got the mailroom job at the bottom and I didn't speak a word. I didn't pick up scissors for a year and I had to sit there next to him. And um, it was the best year of my life. I was sober. I was hanging around sober people. Uh, the salon was, was cool. It was edgy. I was meeting people. And then Chris left to go do a movie and uh, I didn't have a job with Chris. So, and I was working at this other salon with uh, a bunch of the guys from Giuseppe Franco's who were like the Mickey Rourke crew. Yeah. And these guys were just like full gnarly boom, boom, Mancini, like Guido, like yeah. partiers, hairstylist dudes. And they opened a salon and they took me under their wing and I was hanging out with them and I was sober and they're like, you don't know, bro. And I was like, no, you don't know how I do it. You know what I mean? And I, was like, I was like holding on white knuckling, you know, because I wasn't around some people and I was doing hair. And there was a, a sushi restaurant next door that, you know, I was just like, oh, if I just had a tall Kieran or Sapporo and some sake, everything would be better. One right. day I ran next door and I grabbed that large Sapporo and, that sake and we started throwing down with my clients and I'm doing hair color and flipping scissors and the whole thing. And I'm like, told you guys, this is how we do it, you know? And, right. and about 
a month in, they were like, bro, you got to go. You're like sucked up because I started smoking crack again and that whole thing. Sure. And uh, they're like, we really love you, but the clients are asking what's happening to you. You're getting skinny. And they're like, we love you. So th- I left and I went back down to that little West Hollywood place that would take me no matter what. Right. And the owner was really great. And he, he just was unconditional. You know, he was like a really good dude, spiritual. And he was like, it was all good. Mm-hmm. So I ended up back there and I'm loaded and I got nothing and I'm miserable and I'm stealing and I'm panhandling and everything's falling apart mm-hmm. and I'm calling Chris McMillan salon and I'm like, yo, I need to come back. I was working for you and it was amazing. My life was never that good. And the girl at the front desk was like, sorry, we don't got nothing for you. And then boom, I get the phone call and it's like, Chris wants you to be here Monday morning. 7:45. He's got an eight o'clock client. Can you be here? And this was Saturday, and I was like, absolutely, I'll be there. Mm-hmm. So Sunday night, I was smoking meth at a friend's house. I was doing crack cocaine, and I was like, bro, you got to take me home because I got to get to get to work Monday morning. I have to be there. This is my big break, you know? Yeah. And he's like, he's like, I'm not driving you. Like cops are out there. Like you got to wait till the sun comes up. So. I'm staring out his window going, sun's up at three, sun's up at four, <laughs> sun's up. And he's like, no, no, no. Sun actually came up, and he wouldn't take me home. And I was like, what? Fuck you. And I kicked the door open. I kicked the front door open. I walked out to the street. Um, there was a, a, a truck that came by like a, that was delivering towels to the Century Plaza Hotel. And I'm like putting my prayer hands out. Please, please, wave my arms. Give me a ride. The dude picked me up. And I'm like, he's like, what's up, man? And I'm like, can you give me a ride? I live over here. And he was like, yeah. And uh, so I got a ride. And he's like, I th- I'm thinking about doing crystal meth again. And I'm like, no, don't do it. I just did it. Now. My life's miserable. And he's like, <laughs> keep we're talking. And he dropped me off. And I got out because he couldn't take me all the way home. And I got out. And there was a bus that was running. And the bus wasn't even running at this time. I think it was like 5, 15 or whatever in the morning. The sun mm-hmm. had just come up. And um, I waved my hands, and the bus driver stopped in the middle of the street, and she was like, get on. And I was like, no way. I had no money. She's like, fine. Jumped on. I was home within five minutes. Wow. And, and I walked into my house, and I had to be at work at 7, uh, 7.45. Mm-hmm. And I walked into my house, and it must have been about 6.45, and um, – I started searching around for crack because I smoked in my house for the last, you know, three months or whatever. Right. And I found this Coke can and it was filled with uh, resin with Coca-Cola and crack. I'd smoked out of this can for like a week or something. Mm -hmm. And I scraped this whole big pile and I sat down to see if it was actually working. And it was the most powerful stuff I've ever smoked. Oh, and I was like, man. shit, I better do this quick because I got to get in the shower and get to work. So I sat there and I smoked that and I was hallucinating. My heart was jumping out of my chest. Um, I got in the shower. I had two cigarettes left. I had $5 to call a taxi. I got in the shower at 7.30. I called the taxi at 7.29. Um, I was in the shower and I was like, oh, my God, please don't die. Don't die. Like <laughs> hot water cold water my heart's jumping out i'm looking through the smoky shower door to the right people are coming for me i see shadows and i was full paranoid schizophrenic at this point um and all my affairs like i didn't even get into that but so i I, the taxi comes and i get in and i was sucked up i didn't look good i had two cigarettes behind my ear and my jaw's going my tongue's all cut up I get to the salon and I start walking up the courtyard and the manager of the salon at Chris's was a tattooed dude that was sober and Chris was standing there in the kitchen and they both hadn't seen me in a while. Right. And I came walking up and they just started laughing at me. Oh no. And they were like, no way, dude. What has happened to you? They're like, where's the rest of you? (laughs) And they were like, dude, when was the last time you ate? And I was like, it's been a minute. And they're like, get on the burrito. And Chris was like a crackhead too. Right. So Chris was like, 
He's like, dude, like he wanted information. He's like, when was the last time you took a hit? You know, thinking that I would say, you know, yesterday or whatever. And I was like, I looked at my watch and it was like 10 minutes ago. He was like, <laughs> oh my God, no way. And he's like, go ahead and shampoo Matthew Perry. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God. And Matthew Perry was sitting in the, in the waiting room and I walked up. And I'm like, hey, dude, I'm going to shampoo you. And my jaw's going. And he didn't look at me. And I was like, oh, nice. And so he came over to the shampoo bowl. And I'm like standing on top of him. My jaw's going. I got two cigarettes in my ears. And I'm shampooing the dude. And he didn't look at me. And I was like, dope. And I brought him over to the, the chair. And Chris was cutting his hair. And I'm looking, sitting in the courtyard looking through the, the window where Chris cuts hair. Uh-huh. And I'm smoking my cigarette. And I was like, oh, amazing. I'm going to get high at 5 o'clock because – I'm going to make tips from everybody. And plus, Chris gives me $100 cash, so I'll be able to get high about 5.30. I can go, and I played the tape. I was like, I'll jump on the bus. I'll go here, and I'll get there. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wait a minute. And it was the burning bush moment where I was like, that's not why I came here. I came here to get sober and to get my life together, together again. So I put the cigarette out. I ran in. I'm like, I got a proposition for you. Matthew Perry was sitting there, and Chris was there, and I just interrupted the whole thing. And I was like, I got a proposition, Chris. I'm like, dude, if you take me to rehab and pay for my rehab, which was $1,500 a month, I'll work off 15 days. And he's like, wait a minute. I was like, and the the rehab that Chris went to was called Liberty House, Uh and it was literally – the most difficult house that was known for recovery in our area it was behavior <laughs> modification where they strip you of everything oh man and yeah and so i was so afraid to go in there but it was either you know die or or get sober sure. you know and i was at that point and uh i knew i had so much more to offer myself and the world and everything mm-hmm. and uh so i said chris you know will you do this? And he looked at me and he stopped cutting and Matthew looked at him and he grabbed the phone, which was right there at his station. And he called Liberty house and was like, Hey, I got a guy here who needs to get in there. And they're like, sorry, we're full. And Chris was like, looked at me and he's like, they're full. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, seriously, bro, come on. And he, he was like, you guys, this guy's serious. He's one of my workers. And it's a, do or die situation Mm -hmm. and they're like if you can have him here by five o'clock at dinner we'll get him in and we'll put him on the couch only for you and chris was like okay cool awesome hung up the phone looked at his schedule and meg ryan was at 4 (laughs) 30 and so he was like shit i can't do it i have to do meg sure and and i was like oh fuck and he was like hold on a second and he called Meg Ryan, and he, and he rescheduled her, and he drove me to rehab on two twenty four oh four, and uh, and I've been sober ever since. Um, it, Man. you know, he took me to this rehab, and uh, you know, I would see him at meetings, and you know, guys, he would see guys at meetings, and he's like, "You cut your hair," and it was Jason, and I came back, and I was working, you know, those those days off. Cause I got my foot back in the door. I got one day a week working with him. Sure. And, uh, and I stayed sober. I did the work and I stayed in this, this rehab for 15 months at 34 years old. And oh, I was, uh, I, you know, I was making the effort and I was doing what I needed to do to change. And then I continued to work at Chris's and, uh, some people had left and opened other salons, you know, like Andy LeCompte worked there and he opened another salon, which is Andy LeCompte salon, mm-hmm. uh, Neil George, uh, Amanda George and Neil opened another salon. So a couple of spaces open and Chris was like, like, dude, what if I give you a day, one day a week, can you, can you bring some people in? And I was like, absolutely. I called everybody and I packed the place. And then he was like, wow, that's incredible. <laughs> He's like, what if I give you another day? And I was like, yeah. And I called everybody. I was like, please come. you got to support me. They all came in, and I packed a second day, and he's like, this is unbelievable. How about if I give you that chair full load? Do you think you can you can fill it? And I was like, yeah. And I called everybody at this West Hollywood salon that I was working at. And I said, look, I'm coming over to this spot. Please come with me. I need your help. And I ended up working at the Chris McMillan salon. I got my own space. And 
I'm cranking out these men's haircuts, and um, the front desk is like, "Damn, you're fast, you're good, and people are calling who's the best men's haircutter." And they front desk started sending him to me, and Hugh Jackman, Chris Cornell, you know, Brad Gray, yeah. like all these big Hollywood people are in my chair, and and I'm like, "This is unreal. All I got to do is stay sober and do the work." And so my life got really full. And I got, you know, I got this great big life and I met the girl at the front desk. Uh, I went up to her and I was like, you're kind of cute. She was like, you're kind of cute. And I ended up marrying her. Hey. And, uh, and she went on to do Jennifer Aniston's hair. She does, she did five of Jen's movies cause she assisted Chris after and, and uh, Chris and her have a great relationship and Jen and my wife are tight and my wife heads over there and, gets her ready for events and stuff and you know at 34 i had nothing yeah you know, i had bad credit warrants for my arrest i was 137 pounds and i thought my life was over and you know recovery and showing up and being taught how to show up and be of service my life got really amazing i got married bought a house i have two beautiful children six-year-old daughter four-year-old son um I basically can talk, can I? Yeah. Talk this whole podcast. Dude, I love, this is why I have people on, because I, I love your story. That is incredible to go from, like you said, you're doing like crack, and then you, through sobriety, dude, you're cutting like Hugh Jackman, like Bruno Mars, Liam Neeson. Yeah. You're cutting these people hair when, before you couldn't even like take a shower without hallucinating. Like you, Your yeah. life, that's incredible. That is, And I, I love you. that like, I, I, that's my favorite thing about it, it sounds weird to say but that's my favorite thing about uh, my podcast is that we get this side you know we get the other side like we yeah. see this incredible celebrity stylist this hair stylist that's just got the new lease on life but to know this road that led you here was like arguably one of the hardest roads you can take that's that's amazing so like what when you're when you're getting sober because you you tried before like what was the hardest part at first when you like real deal it is go time sobriety now well just just putting those old ideas aside you know it's like like when you go to the gym and you work out uh -huh. you know, it's muscle you know you gotta pay your dues in order to get there it just doesn't like the first time you work out you're like oh my god and then you start going and after a couple of weeks you strengthen up that area so when i first got into recovery i was you know still messing around with girls and making jokes and like, mm -hmm. you know, glamorizing about drinking and using like, Oh, you don't know. Like that I did with those Giuseppe Franco guys. Yeah. You know? And I had to stop, stop saying, you don't know who I think I am and start, you know, getting humble. And I was taught how to do that because it's not easy and it's still in a daily deal. You know what I mean? Like sure. when you're driving and somebody cuts you off, I'm that guy. That's like, Fuck <laughs> you. like pull over and like, you know what I mean? It's like, and then I feel like shit. And then that's what makes me want to drink and use. And it's by putting, you know, multiple good deeds and, and good thoughts and good behavior into this spiritual bank account that keeps me farther away from a drink. Sure. So that's how I tapped into this, uh, this helping the homeless. And it was actually at not even something I thought of. It just kind of happened. Really? So, uh, what happened was, yeah, so the, you know, early on in recovery, I was helping uh, new guys get sober, and I was I was working with guys, and, and that's how I was being of service. And then what happened was, you know, getting so busy and traveling the world and, and, and doing photo shoots and being at the salon, I was like, God, you know, this is my focus. And I wasn't spending as much time as helping other people. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, I still had the foundation that I was kind of resting on. But I went out and I actually I have a lot of people in my chair that I was telling you about, directors, producers. And a lot of these guys are like, you're a fucking character. They're like, you should have your own <laughs> show. And I was like, yeah, yeah, right. You I, know what I, mean? I agree. But somebody somebody was like dude, if you go shoot a sizzle reel, and I'm like, what's that? And they're like, just just shoot something that makes you look as cool as you are. Make yourself look like a rock star. And I was like, 
they're like, shoot your motorcycle, shoot your truck, shoot yourself surfing, you know? <clears throat> and, um, and I was like, okay, cool. And I was like, well, why don't we do this? And I, and I, and I had a director that I was working with. Mm-hmm. Um, but even before that, before I was working the direct with this director, I was, uh, working with somebody else and and we were working on this idea of going out and doing makeovers for dudes, you know, like the queer eye for straight guy, but it was going to be me. So I was like, yeah, like I can spot, like it goes back to me judging people, (laughs) you know, like my opinion. Right. Right. So I'm like, I'm going to just go for it. I'm going to roll up on people because I have the club promoting skills, you know, of not being in fear of like approaching people. So I'd be like, pull over and there's the guy. He's wearing Skechers. His hair's terrible. I'm like, I'm going to serve him up. I'm going to serve him up some shit to make him a better dude, you know? Sure. So we pulled over, and I was like, I was like, hey, I want to cut your hair. And he's like, whoa, beat it, guy. And I was like, okay. And then I go to the next guy. Hey. I had this really <laughs> hot assistant that was with me, and she was. She came up to the second guy. I was like, no, no, no. you, you got to understand. This guy's good, and, like, it's going to be amazing. And the guy – Listen to the girl, but didn't listen to me. Of you course, know what I mean? Of course. <laughs> and, and so we got a guy in my chair, and I cut his hair, and he went back, and it was a huge transformation. I took the guy. I don't even. I, I don't even know. But he looked. He had like parted hair in the middle, and it was all bad. And I turned him into just the full like, like. Uh, I'll make an old reference. Like, <laughs> like I turned him into like I don't know, like Al Pacino or somebody just amazing. You know, yeah. like like. But anyways, so um he goes back to work and he's walking tall and he's feeling good. And then the, <clears throat> the director that I was working with was like, dude, you haul right there. There's a U haul place where these people would stand around for jobs, you know, yeah. and uh, like home Depot where people hang out. And there was a guy, we pull up and the girl who worked there was like, there's a drunk guy on the side. He needs a haircut. And so I was like, cool. And so we went over and cut his hair and I started talking to him about recovery and started doing the transformation with him. And I was like, out of all of these makeovers, that's the one that felt amazing to me. And I went home and I was like, wow, that was incredible. And then weeks went by and I was like, I need to go do that again. And then a couple of months go by and I still didn't do it. I'm telling myself I need to go do that again. And and then I was like, fuck it, I'm going, I'm going to go do it. So I just grabbed my clippers and I went by myself and I, and I did one. I was like, yeah. And then I went and did another one. And then we started filming it and that's how it happened. So it kind of just happened through osmosis or whatever you know that's amazing it so it wasn't even like a i'm gonna go cut hair for the homeless and like a conscious thought it was something that just naturally happened that makes it even better you realize (laughs) yeah i mean i saw this guy mark bustos doing it you know also in that time and he's been in new york city doing it and we actually went out and did a haircut together and this guy was so humble and this was not even that long ago. This was during Thanksgiving. This is when the press started a little bit around what I was doing. And we uh-huh. shot a video during Thanksgiving. <clears throat> and then he called me the next day and he's like, I'm in LA. I want to go do some haircuts. And I was like, amazing. I'm like, you mind if CBS comes down? So they called me and he's like, I don't, I don't need press. Like, I don't want press. He's like, I'm like, is it okay? Cause they want to come see me. And he's like, yeah, that's fine. And he's like, I just want to go do haircuts. And, and I met with him at Starbucks and we started talking and he was like, yeah, he's like, you know, it's a human interaction. It's, you know, talking to these guys. And I was just like, yeah, dude, I get it. I'm like, I got so much to learn from you. You've been doing it for a long time. Yeah. So my ideas shifted a bit more and, um, and I felt even better. So. Sure. I I think it's amazing because that's how I first found out about you was through one of those like viral videos. And I remember just watching what you were doing made me feel better about humanity. I was like, wait a minute, this guy who cuts like celebrity sales in Beverly Hills is giving like essentially giving a celebrity service to a homeless person. That is amazing. It's, it's like a it's like an act of love as opposed to, you know, just saying, I hope you're doing well. Like you're out there and you're in it and like you're making a difference. I think it's really yeah, cool. I, thank you. Thanks. I uh I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just doing <laughs> it, you know, and and the thing is 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 what I found through the social media and posting it, the people that show up to help, yes. it's, 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 it's driving me, you know, and people show up to help. It's unbelievable. I got clients driving, you know, from Newport beach and driving up and people want to fly in and, and people show up and I don't know what I'm doing. 
I <laughs> don't know. Like, I just, I say, we're going to be here, here. And you know what? If it's me doing one haircut, then so be it. It's going to be great. And it turns out to be these day events of amazingness. And, and the thing is, is I'm getting so much, uh, response from people like you that say it motivates them yeah, to do 100%. it. And so it's more than just me helping one person. It's kind of snowballing with everybody wanting to do more. And now I see more hairstylists coming out and, and doing it too. So um, I think me next level is, uh, you know, I, I've been talking to Dr. Phil and we Ooh, just signed nice. a contract because – he is amazing at what he does, and yeah. uh, and I want to start pulling people off the street. And I know enough people who own recovery centers here in town, and this homeless problem in LA is is really bad. Yeah, and it's I think one of the worst in the in the world, I sure. think, or in the country. I don't know, but but I, I don't know all the statistics. As I say, I don't know what I'm doing, but yeah. I'm learning more <laughs> as I go along. Of course, um, but. 60,000 people and they just did a count uh, recently where they do this homeless count. I think it got like 20% or more worse in the last year. So we definitely, we all need to help a little. Like I say, you know, if we all do a little, we can help out a lot. And I believe a haircut can change somebody's life. Those are my, my slogans right now. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, I'm talking to people who know the mayor. I've been talking to the deputy chief. And I am wanting to get involved. I want to, um, like I said, pull people off the street uh, for a guy that is like me who was ready. You know what I mean? Sure. And I think that's what I can do. Uh, it's really just find a guy who, just like me, who's just sick and tired of being sick and tired and is willing to do the work. And if I can find somebody like that, then I'll just take them and I'll drive them to the spot where I know there's a bed and there's three meals a day and there's guys going to be pulling his covers to make sure he's doing the deal and, you know, taking him to meetings and, and, you know, the ultimate is to transfer him back into society with work and uh, a place to live. So that's what I'm hot on right now. Sure. That's incredible. Do you have any advice for someone who is uh, like for somebody who wants to get clean? Um, yeah. I mean, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be ready. You know, they mm-hmm. taught me it's kind of like, you know, the, you watch the uh, dangerous jobs in the world, most dangerous jobs. And oh, yeah. you got to picture yourself like, like a guy who's on those Alaskan fishing boats, right? Oh yeah. And the guy goes overboard and he falls off into this ice cold water and they, they circle back around and they throw him a life jacket or the donut, right? Yeah, yeah. And the guy's like the guy's like, I'm good, I can do this, I got this and they just tries to swim and he doesn't pick up the life preserver. Mm-hmm. You have to be ready to get sober. Like the dying, you know, sure. is reaching for a life preserver. So, so what I say to anybody who's sick and tired of being sick and tired mm-hmm. and who is ready, use whatever resources you can to get into recovery and put yourself around people that are doing the deal. Sure. Um, it's, you know, it's kind of like the Willoughby's pack. You know, if you're in the middle of the pack, you're safe. Right. And it's not going to be easy. It's, it wasn't easy. Detox wasn't easy for me. You know, I said I was in and out for four years. But <clears throat> when I threw down my hands and I was like, I'm sick of being Jason Schneidman. Mm-hmm. Like, show me how to be somebody new, you know. And <clears throat> they were like, you need to be willing, 100%. And I was like still kicking and screaming like I wasn't able to get laid for six months at this house you know like that was everything to me like I didn't go you know like (laughs) without sex six months like that sounds like you know I'd rather eat my shit you know (laughs) so um so I uh I did it and you know at the end of that six months uh I uh got the pass to go hook up with this girl and 
and that day some situation happened where I wasn't even involved or to blame, but uh, once again, I came up as somebody that was involved, and they were like, you're not going anywhere. You're sitting down at this table, and you're writing 10,000 words, and that was our punishment at this house. You'd have to write words. Right. And so I got up from this dinner when they were grouping me, and I was like, you know what? And I walked into the other room, and I was, like, holding my fist up to punch the wall because I wanted to get laid so bad, you know? <laughs> and uh, and I just threw my fist down, and I just started laughing. And I was like, you know, I'm like, willingness. I have to be willing to surrender whatever it is I think I need or I want in order to become a different person. And I walked back in to the dinner and was laughing and they're like, what? They're like, you're going to leave. What, what is this laugh? Like you're, you're going to leave recovery, aren't you? Aren't you going to leave? And I was like, no, 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 I'm good. And it wasn't until I stopped fighting mm-hmm. and I was like, teach me how to be a different person. Sure. Was when the shift happened. That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, what advice would you give to like family and friends of people who are going through that? Um, I think most important is kind of like what my sister did for me because you can't get somebody sober. They right. have to want it. So all you can do is you, this is what you're supposed to do. So you can go to get help yourself for recovery to learn and understand recovery. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a family disease, you know. Sure. And everybody plays a part, the enabler. And the thing is, is you have to be able to shut the door on this person. You can't enable them right. because you're going to keep them. You're going to keep them in their drugging and drinking or whatever it may be. Um, the other thing is, is you can uh, you can be there for them and tell them that you love them and you support them. And when they're ready, you're there for them, and you do everything in your power to get them into recovery. You know when they're willing, and you just stand. You know, stand your ground. And I know it's easier said than done because you're, you're dealing with sons and daughters who you love. And I have a son and a daughter, and I, you know, I I, I can only imagine right. what it's like to shut the door on somebody. But you know, you have to be willing to disengage and just tell them that you love them and be there for them when they're ready. And you can pick them up and you can take them to recovery, and that's about it. Sure, that makes sense. I I love how open you are about it because I think authenticity goes a long way in today's world, and just how candid and honest you are, I think really is part of why your message is so powerful as well. It yeah, comes through. Yeah. It comes through. It's also great that your well, last name I... literally translates to cut man. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, bro. I'm trying to figure out. I'm, I've been working on a product line for years, and uh, I'm like nobody's gonna buy Schneidman. You know what I mean? I'm like, but they buy Keel. You know, they like heels. What's heels? You know what I mean? That's so, true. That's right, true. Now, right now, I'm just the men's groomer, and uh, and I found that, that name, and it was open when I was searching years ago, and I'm like, that's a pretty cool brand name, the men's groomer, you know? I, so, love, I love it. <clears throat> yeah. I think so it's I, fantastic. I'm gonna have some, I'll have some products here soon. I've been working on for like seven years, like I said, my formulations of the perfect paste and the perfect pomade and stuff for guys that are balding and thickening sprays and all the stuff that I use. I just, uh, you know, not to, not to pitch that that's not what this is about, but but I'm excited to, to have some good stuff out there. Yeah, as you should be. It's a lot of hard work come to fruition. I think it's great. But uh, can you believe we've been talking for almost an hour already? I told you I'd do 20 minutes. I know. Fuck, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm Are you so- kidding me? It's me. I was- I'm sorry. I don't shut up. No, dude. I've done, you know? I've done like, no joke, the, the longest one I've ever done was almost three hours because yeah. the guest stories were oh, just incredible. I'm, I'm into That's it. That's awesome. <laughs> so, no, thank, well, thank you. I really appreciate great. it. Uh, you yeah, know. no, and thank you for letting me you know, carry the message. I think that's the most important part is people listen, people go out and they help. And I feel like seriously, one more time, if we all do a little, we can help out a lot. And that's, you know, with this homeless thing, it's, it's like, what do we do? What can you do? Sure. And my sister came the other day and she was like, I figured it out. <laughs> Socks and wipes and stuff of that sort, you know, listening. She's like, I'm going to put those in the backseat of my car. Cause you know, when you see the guy at the light where they're like begging for money, yeah, 
flip them, flip them a bag with a socks and it, and you know, some, some wipes and a, and a toothbrush. And I was like, I love that. And I'm like, that's the perfect thing of just like, what can we, you know, what can we do? And, and if we all do a little, we can help out a lot. And yeah. I mean, <clears throat> it's going to take a lot, but these are our neighbors and, and their people and, you know, human interaction oh, is so like important. getting sparse, getting sparse. These days. We're at the <laughs> gas station and we're at the pumps and we just swipe and, you know, it's all computers. And so, <clears throat> you know, if I just grab somebody's hand and, <clears throat> and massage it for a minute, you know, this one guy I, I did that for and, and he, he was a black guy whose hands were super ashy and he had tear marks coming down his face that were like engraved in there. Mm-hmm. And I grabbed um, some face wipes and I wiped off his face and his skin color came back and his hands, I put lotion on there. And by the end of the day, he was the number one helper at our event and he was just cleaning up and <clears throat> it was amazing. His name was Jethro. Wow. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, he was great. And another, uh, another story was my wife and kids came down and a girl was, was, was so excited walking off with a blanket and she walked by my kids and my wife and my wife and kids saw her and she said, last night I was sleeping on cardboard and tonight I get to sleep on this big comfy blanket. Oh, and, that's uh, awesome. I told this story a couple of times and I got emotional and <clears throat> just <clears throat> being able to for my kids to see that and hear that makes it all all worth it that day. You Abs- know? Absolutely. That's that's the kind of stuff that at the end of the day that really really matters. You know, human human interaction it means everything. And uh, yeah. you're, you're you're doing the good work out there, man. And I'm uh I'm very very glad that I got to talk to you because this this was really fun. I hope you had a good time. I did. I had a great time. I love talking about myself. Yeah, right, <laughs> dude. If you ever want to come back on, you got my number now. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Um, I appreciate it, man. <laughs> where can, where can people find you online? Um, so, uh, well, I have the mensgroomer dot com mm-hmm. where it it shows my body of work and the the store where I have stuff. But mostly the interaction and everything is through my Instagram, yep. which I started right when Instagram started. And so I'm at the men's groomer, and uh, you know that's where. I post up my videos and my event, uh, which is usually about two weeks out. I'm not a big planner, yeah. kind of spontaneous. <laughs> so everybody's like, when's the next one? And I'm like, oh, okay, here we go. You know, and then I'll just post it up. And, uh, <clears throat> and that ties to Facebook at Jason Schneidman mm-hmm. on Facebook. So the men's groomer Instagram ties to Jason Schneidman. Uh, on Facebook and those same videos and posts go to both. And that's kind of been my, you know, social media channels. And, and I do all of that stuff myself. Like I'll go out and I will film, well, I'll have somebody film obviously an assistant or whatever. And then that night I'll come home and I'll get on this uh, video shop app that I found that works for me. And I cut all these videos on my phone myself. Sweet. That is incredible. Well, yeah, dude, yeah, yeah. thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And... Thanks, Brian, and thanks, everybody, for listening. Have a great Monday, everybody. Yeah. Woo. Signing off with the whistle. <laughs> thanks, man. Oh, you I guys. love it. Later. Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of uh, The Interesting Podcast. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Jedi Brian. If you want to follow the show, it's at Pot of Interest on Twitter. And uh, if you enjoyed this, uh, if you wouldn't mind, go to iTunes and give it a five-star rating. That pushes us to the front of uh, the iTunes algorithm, and it helps book guests. Um, yeah, so I really appreciate you listening. Until next time, be well.